Good evening, everyone. It's really wonderful to see everybody here. Um, so, are we ready to begin? Sure. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> takes a couple of seconds to warm up, so just bear with us for a minute, and then it will be good. Or I'll be good at least. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did want to kind of jump off of what Mar um, Mariah was saying before. Um, Jose and Matt are dear friends of mine, and they began that conversation. We had begun that conversation. There's Jose and Matt over there. And they were like, you have to meet Nancy at Inform. She's lovely and you guys will be kindred spirits and so we had a conversation and I remember sitting upstairs and it was exactly that as soon as I sat down we began our conversation and um, we just had this moment we were talking about ugly pretty oh, right. Jelly lead. <laughs> yeah and when her eyes just like Nancy's eyes just were sparkling as we were talking about ugly pretty I'm like oh my gosh this woman is like a kindred spirit, just as Jose had said. So that kind of started the conversation, and then... It was 30 minutes, and we were doing windows and workshops, and the workshops haven't happened yet, don't worry. You they didn't will. miss them. They will. They will. Yes. So it's been such a pleasure, and last week was just an indulgent pleasure, having, if any of you visited, and I know lots of you did, well, Lyle was in the window working. So gracious, inviting people into the store and really explaining the work and um, the way he works. And for those of you who might not know, the, the busts are made from stuff from our homes and the store. So they're all made from what would technically be garbage or thrown out. So um, it was also amazing because we all feel like we're part of these pieces, which is really great. So here we come, first question. <laughs> um, so have you ever doubted what you were thinking of doing? Have you ever doubted yourself? And if you've ever doubted yourself, how have you dealt with it? I don't know if, I've, I don't know if I've ever doubted the fact that I'm an artist. I think it was more about figuring out where that artistic journey would eventually lead me to work. How would I get from point A to point B? And what does point B even look like? So it wasn't about like, do I want to be a mathematician or a scientist? Never an option. Me and math, terrible. Um, so art was up from day one. So I never questioned that. I, like, I remember as a little kid, uh, I would ask for crayons before breakfast and that was just kind of the thing. I wanted my crayons, I wanted to doodle, and I remember wanting to draw perspective before I went to kindergarten, and my mom, who's brilliant, and she saw this little kid taking a crayon, like stabbing it through a piece of paper over and over again, and she realized, well, my son isn't, this, isn't an aggressive child, and like, why is he doing this? And then she realized that the house that I was drawing, she, wanted, she knew that I was trying to make it 3D, but I didn't know how to do 3D when I was four. So she was like, Lyle, I think that we need to have a lesson. And I was like, okay. And so she taught me, it was the house and then a package of lifesavers, how to make that cylindrical shape. So I remember going to kindergarten, and I feel like I'm kind of ignoring you guys over here, I'm sorry. Hi, Milo. Um, and so, bef you know, I was in kindergarten and I was like, why does my house look like this? And the other kids' houses look like this with the sun and the little, you know? And um, but that really was the start of it all. So there was never doubt. I know that was a very long answer to your question, Nancy. Um, but surely a, a have, when things don't go right or when you can't, um, you have dreams and you're working towards them. I'm just wondering how you yeah. deal with that kind of adversity or if it's adversity at all, it might not be. It might be the best thing happening, that door closing and some other door opens. Yeah, I mean, how do you look at it? There was definitely, I would be lying if I didn't say that there was tons of ad adversity growing up. I grew up in small town Saskatchewan with a population of less than 180 people. 
note the complete lack of zeros after that 180. Because <laughs> I remember telling someone, they're like, oh yeah, I grew up in a small town too, it was like 110,000. I'm like, no, 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 sweetie, it didn't say 110,000. I said 108, done. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so growing up there and never, I was, I never belonged, I never fit in. And um, when we talk about dreams, so many of those dreams I didn't even know were even possible because there was no, there was none of that stuff to even touch on or to have access to, it just didn't exist. So it's not like I could, you know, and Google didn't exist back then, computers were just like, they were coming in in grade seven or something like that, it was crazy. So anyways, um, getting out of small town Saskatchewan and then realizing that there is a world out there that is endless of possibilities and you can go after these dreams, then it's just those internal battles of, um, I think it's a classic scenario of, you know, imposter syndrome in different events or different situations. Sometimes I'll be like meeting someone, I'm like, I cannot even believe that we're sitting here in this moment. Um, Victor and, so Victor and Rolf, the designers, they wrote the foreword for my book and I remember getting an email from them and I first of all thought it was a joke. I thought they were punking me and I was like, ha ha ha, that's so funny that Victor and Ralph wrote this message to me. And they said, you know, we're big fans of your work and we want you to come to Amsterdam so we can meet you. And so I kind of thought carefully about that answer and thought, you know, maybe it is legitimate. I'll just send them a message back. And then weeks later, I'm in Amsterdam sitting at this table up in their atelier in their beautiful space and it, imposter syndrome and the doubt of like I, like I idolized you guys and now you're telling me that you're big fans of mine and they're like, we'll do whatever you want us to do. Just let us know and we want to support you. We believe in your work 100%. And I went back to the hotel and I sat there on the bed and I burst into tears and just was so emotional because it was like a, a moment where I didn't know that that could happen, that dream could happen. And then when it was actually happening, then you're like, wait a minute, like this can actually take place. This can happen. This is a real thing. So, but there's been many ups and downs in terms of just dealing with life stuff, breakups. I think that those kind of put a little, do a number on you and it's hard sometimes to get out of bed in those moments, but then you always have your art. You always have that one true thing that you can always come back to. And, and this is, this is my heart. Yeah. That's a hard one to follow up <laughs> after. So, okay. The other question is totally <laughs> dumb. <laughs> What's my favorite color? <laughs> No, oh, it was just like, I know um, Kaido-san here, he has a little motto he says in the morning. Um, do you have a motto? Do you have a thing like, you know, like do you have something that you, that you say to yourself because you just want to keep that intention, you know, first and foremost, yeah. and you kind of use it? Yeah, it's, it's all about, I say, you know, trust your gut, trust your instinct, and everything that you do, do it with love. That's it, done. And I think that's the best way to, not just in art, but that's how you should live your life. You, you don't question those things, you do it because it's from your heart. Um, and when you do something that's passionate, that you're passionate about, that really truly does come from within, people sense that, they can feel that. And one of the nicest compliments that I've, I remember reading a comment one time, and they said, Lyle, we, we love your work, but we can tell that what's behind it, there is a true authentic spirit and you do it with love. And when I was reading it, I was like, are you inside of my brain? Like it was very bizarre that they had tapped into that. And it's the most um, humbling. So 
So your process, because we watched you, we had gathered boxes and boxes of stuff. Um, and everybody brought stuff in and weird stuff and colored stuff and everything. And your process started just um, downstairs, you were just sorting. And how did that, how did that work for you? How does this process work for you? So this process here in Inform, um, so all of the boxes, like you said, are there and you go into it and you don't, you try not to think too much. You just experience everything that you're looking at and things just automatically will jump out to you. So it's like this shape or this color or like this texture and you haven't processed any of it. You're just, yeah, I'm attracted to this. I'm attracted to that. And you just start to do that. And then as you're doing it, then you're like, oh, wait a minute there's something happening here with this, or there's a, a moment that's happening here. Um, the look, um, I think you actually picked up the piece of blue sponge, didn't you, Nancy? Mm -hmm. So there's a piece of blue sponge that was framing something. I don't know what it was framing. It was in the Buffy frame. kitchen, I think. Okay. Upstairs. I think it was one of the doors or something. Yeah. yeah. So Nancy had brought this piece of blue sponge, which is actually in the sculpture in the front window on that side. And when I saw it, it's this beautiful like periwinkle blue and there's a piece of like kind of ochre tape that was on the one bottom corner and rather than taking off the piece of tape I was like well that's the color story right there it's asking to be made into this piece it's saying Lyle here's your color palette like go to it so that created the whole piece was based on just that piece of tape that was stuck to the sponge so it's all very instinctive, it's intu intuitive, um, and yeah, you don't question it, you just... And then when it starts coming out, that's the fun part because it happens here in the window, but it happens every day in the studio where... This will probably sound silly and you can judge me later after you leave. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's like your hands are being puppeted by like it's like a Pinocchio kind of moment where your hands are doing something and you don't know what they're actually doing and they're making something and you don't even know what you're making, for real. And then all of a sudden something's on your table there in the studio and you're like, huh, that's really cool, my hands just did that. <laughs> and it sounds like super elementary and basic, but it's the truth. And to just trust that your hands are going to cut and glue and paint in the way that they're supposed to and to not ever... Um, critique that it's just pure so that judging or you just cut that voice out yes yeah because I think that once you start once you start asking yourself or questioning yourself in terms of um, is this going to be cool are people going to like this? How is it going to be received? Um, are people going to buy this? It takes you off the path of authenticity, I believe. When you do it because you have to do it, you have to create, that's when the truest art comes out because you haven't done it with a motivation of like, well, I can see it hanging on the wall in this person's house and they're going to pay this much money for it. That's not the... I don't think that that brings you to the place of authenticity. So I just shut that all out and just do it. But we still had, like, we knew we had a, I, five busts. So there was, a, like, a little bit of structure. Yeah. And we had a timeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I didn't think he could make the timeline. I thought you just, I just didn't, you worked so quickly. Thanks. It was just, I shocking i mean you had one and a half done in a day it's just like whoa it was <laughs> crazy it was crazy because he seemed so intricate and so much thought and depth and everything and i do know that you did do some of the work at home yes. out of the tv yeah. yeah yeah some of the paper rolls and that kind of stuff the mind-numbing things are kind of like you wish you had like a minion to do um <laughs> i don't have a minion so the TV so, works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about some of these pictures? Yeah. Or? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I love them. <laughs>
Okay, so this was the very first, um, the very first shoot uh, for an international publication. This actually again was shot in Amsterdam, and it was a five-day shoot for Candy Magazine, and I was I got a very big spread. I was very happy. The only person that got she got one more page than me was Miley Cyrus. I was like, that was pretty close. And for the first one, I was like, I can't complain about that. But that was from uh, the the main piece here is from a dear friend of mine, Charity, and she's an orthodontist. And so that was children's orthodontic gear. And um, the bra parts were from coworkers at work. I remember the day when I asked them, I'm like, could you bring in your old bras, but like the nude color of bras that you might be getting rid of? And they're like, okay, well, whatever. Um, but yeah, so then that was the that was the very first one. So this picture always has uh, like a, a special place because that whole experience working with the team in Amsterdam, they treated me like like a, a royal. They were like feeding me little pieces of like apple into my mouth as I was standing. It was it was lovely. It was a great experience. I'm like, can I just have another person to like feed pieces of apple? Um, no, it was great. Um, this is we. I just wanted to show some images from the book. Hello. Um, so yeah, I just thought I could show a couple of these. I remember really contemplating about, you can't really see it that good in this picture, but the makeup I was really thinking about like, because I made the sculptural pieces, I took apart all the doilies and all of that. And I like this juxtaposition of like old lady doilies with like very street basketball, you know, boys in the hood kind of feeling. <laughs> Girls in the hood, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then the print on the texture of the basketball was like, there it is. So I just started painting on pieces of basketball and laying them onto my face. And it just printed out like, you can see all the little bits of white and then the stencil of the, the rolling or Rawlings or whatever you, however you say that brand, clearly not a basketball fan. Um, but then that just was the, the makeup. So that one is in the window. This was the cover of um, the book. This one has a lot of um, personal it's very personal and so Fabian Barron he did the direction the art direction for this book and he asked you know Lau what is the image that you want for the cover of your book and he's like can you give me some options and I just kept coming back to this one because I always like the concept of things that are like all white very monochromatic and so I chose this image but I said the reason why I'm choosing this image is that it really is so many parts of my soul are in this. Um, <clears throat> so my partner, we went for my 40th birthday to Italy. And um, <clears throat> that trip, we went to this church. And in the church, below the church, there are these kind of catacombs. I don't know if you call them like that, but they're all these beautifully ornately decorated with all human bones just everywhere and they're gorgeous and kind of morbid but beautiful and so on that trip which was a trip of a lifetime it was amazing um the Givenchy shoe box was you know I needed to buy a pair of shoes obviously um there is a tube on the forehead that was from the Gucci restaurant there in Florence which is spectacular and they served like the salad dressing in this little tube and I'm like that tube's coming home with me um and the bones were from a family Easter dinner and at the end of the meal I said you know I really would like to use these bones so Mara who's in the back there um, she said, okay, everybody, like, we're going to keep these bones for Lyle, and she packaged them all up, and I brought them home to the studio, and I bleached them and attached them to my face, 
There's bits of like my mom, she, the pierogi makers on the ends that are kind of like pseudo earrings. Yeah, pierogi makers with like canning jar rings and vintage 19, like 60 hairpin things. Um, so literally there's parts of my family and my partner and the people who I love so dearly in this world are all part of that image. So it just made sense to have that as the cover. <clears throat> Uh, this image is important to me because <clears throat> uh, one of the first crafts that I remember my mom doing, she was the queen of recycling and taking something, turning it into something from nothing. And she created this peacock out of these like pastel styrofoam. Do you remember the pastel styrofoam egg cartons? They would come in like pale pink and pale like mint. You guys, you know what I'm talking about. Like, don't leave me high and dry. <clears throat> um, so she created this peacock all out of these cut pieces of styrofoam. And I remember as this little kid thinking, oh my gosh, my mother is a magician. She's a genius. And I think that that has always, that seed of taking something and turning it into something else was always present. <clears throat> so this image here is all done with egg cartons. And it's kind of like an homage to my mom. Um, and there's pieces of friends' jewelry bits in there as well to add that little bit of like couture quality to an egg carton. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. So how did the book come about? Did you go to Rizzoli and say, I want to do this or? So, um, I used to work at Mac for 16 years and the old creative director, he had said, he was like, I'm, you need to do a book, Lyle. So he had said his friend was Charles Myers at Rizzoli, who's the head of Rizzoli in New York. And he said, I'll send Charles a message. So he sent a message on, on my behalf and the conversations didn't really happen very quickly from that perspective. But then when, so Fabian Barron had been following my work on Instagram, and then when he said, we need to do a book, he wrote a letter to Charles, and Charles was like, okay, well, if Fabian is saying that we need to do this, then let's do this. And so the conversation quickly became very real, and um, it's been, it was like a life dream, Nancy, to like, to have, yeah, a Fabian Baron. <laughs> to have a Rizzoli book and to have it done with those people. And I remember the first meeting going to New York and sitting in this boardroom and there was this long table and everyone filed in and um, Brian, or Fabian was like, come sit next to me, Lyle. I was like, so sitting next to him thinking like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. And then they had the big projector on the one wall and they started showing me the cover and the different options for text and stuff. And my eyes totally filled with tears. I'm sure none of you are surprised about that by now. Um, but uh, he's like, you don't like it, Lyle? And I'm like, oh, contraire. Like, I'm in total awe and I can't believe this moment is happening and this is a dream come true. And it, yeah, it's kind like my baby dream. now. <clears throat> kind of a big dream. And then they asked, how do you want the, the launch to go? And I said, I've always wanted to have windows at Bergdorf's. And Fabian's like, well, that's easy, Lyle. I'll just call Linda. That's no problem. So he called Linda. And Linda's like, oh, I love his work. Yeah. So then a couple weeks later, we started talking. And I remember writing an email to Linda Fargo. And I was trying to maintain this like very business, very like professional way of writing to this person who I She's a legend. And after I was done writing it, I looked at all the words and I was like, it's all too professional and it's not really from my heart. So just get rid of it all and just write from your heart, Lyle. And so I did, I just wrote her this message and at the end of the email I said, I don't know if you're a hugger, but if you are, I'm sending you a big hug. 
And she responded to me within like seconds. She's like, Lyle, I'm a big hugger and I'm accepting that hug and I'm giving you one back. And she's like, we're so excited to have you here at Bergdorf's. And I was just like, <laughs> bawling. <clears throat> but you know what, we t I mean, I, jo I joke about crying and all of that stuff. And as an artist, you know, I think growing up, you always think about how it's like a weakness and it's, um, it's, it's considered a flaw to be like emotional. Oh, Lyle, he's so emotional, he's so sensitive and all of that. And now as I've gotten older, I realize that that's, that's my superpower and that's how I can connect with people. And that's how, when you tap into that, that's how you can live your truest artist self and any self. So any yeah, self. Any, any self. self. So have you ever wondered, because thinking of, you know, the photography you were using, iPhone photography, other photography, iPhone at the beginning or whatever at the beginning, yeah. um, Instagram, people following you on Instagram, have you ever thought what your life would have been like, like even 20 years ago, like your artist life? Well, I think that, I mean, I feel very grateful for Instagram because Instagram really did open up. It allows you to like put your work out there socially and have all of these people who you never thought you would have access to, you suddenly have access to them. And, you know, like Cher has a copy of my book and what her best friend was like, she, she's a big fan. And I remember looking at Cher's Instagram, she was following like eight people at the time. It was like Lyle XLX. I'm like, so the fact that Cher you, that would never have been possible, right? No, that's what I'm wondering, like what, because artists have existed for it ever. Yes. I mean, our artistic need for beauty and art and creativity and all that. And just, I just, it just makes me wonder how different your work would be, whether it would be different at all or, or I mean, music cross boundaries when you think of music as art records and the replication of music but visual artists i guess life magazine we all had life magazine like but less streams maybe that was different what do you guys think i th i think that the the amount of people that would see it would be different and then the technology of just how it was captured was obviously different but i can i feel that the work would still be the same because it's that's my it is my signature now i use 100 percent found objects there is nothing that's bought at a craft store it's like the real deal. glue sticks come on okay glue sticks and, 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 and makeup that's, but everything else is really it's a found found object right so um i think that principle underlying theme will would not have changed um but yeah so when in the book, if you guys haven't seen the book, the photograph is on one side and on the other side in Lyle's handwriting, which I want to know how long it took you to write those things, write them and write them. Like my handwriting is <laughs> atrocious now. I used to be able to print. Now I just, I don't know, all we do is type. It's just dumb. Um, but how long did it take you to write? They're very humorous. So they tell the story of the photograph, but with so much humor and life. So though, you're looking at a still photograph, you're reading kind of this in points almost chaotic or really mm -hmm. lifelike, funny story. So how long did that take? So, I mean, I always attach a story to each of the image when I post on Instagram. So the stories were, had already been developed, um, but then the writing of it did take some time and I would have to send like big huge files to new york with every single i would have to write each one like three times and then they'd be like well Lyle, we like the r in this one but could you and i'm like couldn't we just like swap out that word And they're like no we prefer it if you wrote it again so i'm like okay so you'd write it again send it off again and it was uh and then all the page numbers were written in my hand as well so it was it's a labor of love for sure yeah that's a labor <laughs> But that was Fabian's, he said, you know, I think 
I want to have these stories in here, obviously, but they need to be in your handwriting because it adds that personal effect, that personal moment. And so um, I was like, yes, absolutely. He's like, and it needs to be done in pencil. He was very clear. He's like, pencil. I'm like, okay, done. Pencil it is. Wow. And the images in the book and the images here are all things without any kind of... Um, uh, Word am I looking for? Nobody's paid you money to include their product, or there's nothing like that in your work. It's no thank you sponsorship, thank you. There's no sponsors involved. Do you think in the future people are going to want you to put their stuff in your work? Have people approached you? What are you going to do? Well, like my so my first collaboration was with Gucci, and they contacted me. I remember being on the Sky Train and getting that message from their. PR department, and again, I was just like, this isn't real. I should probably just stop thinking that. Um, but, you know, they're like, we love what you're doing. So, so then as soon as we started that dialogue, I said, well, I would really love it then if you would send me your garbage from your atelier. And they're like, Gucci doesn't have garbage. <laughs> quote, end quote, for real. I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure you do. Um, but okay, maybe you just don't have any trash that ever touches your floors. Um, but they said, but we'll send you a brand new handbag. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was at another job and I got home and there was this beautiful box and I opened it up and I went to the, immediately into the studio and grabbed a pair of scissors and I was like, here we go. And just started cutting up this beautiful new Gucci bag and cried a few fashion tears and uh, but I was like this is what I do so I'm not you when you asked me to do this project you knew that you were going to get this so were they happy so they were I was told they're like Gucci are some serious picky bitches if I can say that <laughs> sorry but those were the words there, like, Gucci has some serious picky bitches there, and, you know, just so you know, while you might have to do many edits of the image. So I was like, okay. So I remember, like, getting the email ready to send, and I hovered over that button for so long, and then all of a sudden I was like, do it. And then I woke up the next morning, and they're like, we love it. No edits needed, and I was like, yes. So, but that look was a Gucci bag and tin foil from the kitchen and that had actually had like been cooked in. So like there was, you could feel the, almost like a grease or a film on the tin foil, but I was like, this is true to my art and I'm pairing this tin foil from the kitchen with a Gucci bag that we all know how much that costs. So, um, my partner's old uh, compass and protractor, like geometry set from elementary school, many, many moons ago, incorporated. Um, that's not my hair, everyone asks. It's a, just a piece of magazine. Um, this picture here, I always feel a, a connection to this piece because my grandfather, who who no longer is alive, we never really had a very good relationship. He lived in Louisiana in the backwoods. And let's not go there. Anyways, um, but he always said that true men wear Old Spice deodorant. That's what real men wear, Lyle. And I was like, okay, I got a lot of work cut out for me. <laughs> it's going to take more than Old Spice. Um, so this was kind of like a nod to my grandfather, and that's why I really felt that it needed to include elements of like army and military and like beer drinking, the coaster and stuff that's been completely manipulated, but then it needed to have like kind of this 1960s updo thing happening to kind of mesh all those worlds together. So anyways. And there was a very special day at the atelier in Amsterdam with Victor and Ralph. And 
That's the first picture that you see in the book. And I remember them coming into the studio space and they were in their jeans and t-shirt and they said, you know, Lau, what do you want us to wear? And I was like, I'm going to tell you what to wear. They're like, yeah, like you're directing this. So just tell us what you want to wear. I'm like, okay. So they had their assistants bring the clothes in exactly how I had requested. And they were the most gracious, lovely humans. I can't say enough good things about them. And every once in a while, now I'll get a text from Ralph and he'll be like, Hey, Lyle, how are you? We're in Paris right now. I just wanted to check in and see how things are going. And like, just lovely. So um, it's always nice to meet people who you look up to, who are actually nice and kind and do good things out of their heart. I think it's so refreshing to meet people like that. So I still believe most of us are like that. I like that you believe that. I think so. <laughs> So I know a lot of people from around the world send you special garbage now. Think about it. Yeah. We have a drop box here in the back of the <laughs> store if you have anything you want to drop off ever. We've got three boxes full at the moment. Well, not quite full. Anyway, what is the most extraordinarily, oh my God, thing that you got? Or from whom? That's a really good question, Nancy. Um, I stopped. Uh, I remember a, f a friend from elementary school. She sent her, sent her daughter's mouth guard. She's like, she wanted to, her daughter wanted to be part of the art, and so she wanted to give it. And she's like, well, would Lyle use this? So she's like, just for the record, it was sanitized like a million times. Like, um, so that was a very odd thing. Recently, though, from Mexico City, a box, excuse me, a box came, and this woman had been collecting all of these metal hearts from all over the city. Yeah, and they're like these tin pieces of like really flimsy metal, but some of them have like that classic kind of Catholic iconography spikes around them and. They're aged and patinaed, and you can really tell that they've been like, collected from around the street. And she's like, I really hope that you can find a way to use them. So I'm itching to get back to the studio and make a piece with them for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you want to do some more photographs and then? Um, this was a collaboration with Moschino and Jeremy Scott. So Moschino sent me all of there. So they did have garbage. FYI, Gucci. Um, so Moschino did have garbage, and this one was all made of the bra pads, shoulder pads, um, lingerie tags, tags, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and we shot that in LA. And same with this look here. This was all like shoe prototypes that were completely taken apart and different fabrics that were dipped in glue and rearranged to make more like floral kind of shapes, hand painted. Um, and they just, they were so gracious about giving me as much time as I needed. They weren't rushing me to get done. Jeremy, Jeremy would come in and be like, how are you, babe? Like, do you need anything? And just take your time. And so I would spend hours creating and then I'd come out. And then he's like, you can go into my closet and choose whatever you want. So I would choose. Cause I like that the clothes are not really clothes. They're more just, structural pieces um, and then this was for Vogue Italia. Um, this one here, this was shot in Paris and on the flight over there, the, the flight attendant had um, given me a pillow to use and so as soon as I saw the pillow, I loved the color of it, that kind of like hospital, like, I don't know. I'm like, I know where this pillow is going. So I took the pillow from the flight and I don't know, I guess I have a thing with these old bras, but I <laughs> felt that the bras, I don't know, tapping into something here, ladies. Um, so yeah, I felt like the bras just, and the color palette, you know, it just all worked, at least in my mind it did. 
And so I got to set and the, none of the makeup had been planned for this particular one. And uh, I sat down and I kind of was like, okay, well, I always pack like a suitcase just filled with other random stuff just in case something else will spark the imagination. And I just saw this bag of old rubber bands that were so like, so old. Um, and I think I was like, I think that's the look. It's just rubber bands. Let's just keep it simple. And so it was rubber bands, bra, and a pillow from the airline. Voila. But you glued it on your face. Which you took glued them a, on your face. a long time. <laughs> I cannot imagine what your days are like when you're doing the shoots. You said there was lots of time in some of them, but some of them must be like, okay, we have a budget. We've got a schedule here. At what, and yeah, it's... It's hard because your face takes a beating, right? I'm leaving tomorrow to London to go shoot for the March issue of V Magazine, and I'm expected to do four creations in one day and then four creations the next day. So if anyone wants to put out positive energy or vibes into the universe on the 17th, or sorry, yeah, the 17th and 18th of this month, I will graciously accept those positive vibes because I know that uh, I will be exhausted by the end of that shoot um, and my face will be ravaged. <laughs> but you're a professional and you do what you need to do, yes. right? I mean, isn't fashion a bit like that also? Yeah, I think that there's always these like crazy time constraints and there's limits and but everyone's there for the same purpose of creating something that's beautiful and you just kind of bond together and there is a deep appreciation for everyone in the room that's bringing their own craft to the project and so you just go with it and know that at the end of the day the, the beauty will be, have been created. So I'm very excited about this particular shoot. Sounds yeah. great. So. Do any of you have questions? Okay. So I, I'd like to know what different types of glue you use. <laughs> <laughs> I use only hot glue. Yes. <laughs> um, so there's a surgical adhesive that I use called Prozaid that is really, really strong. It's like, let's say if you were born with some facial um, abnormality, if I can call it that, for lack of a better word, that seems very politically incorrect. But let's say if you were born without a nose, for instance, and you had a prosthetic nose, that's the type of glue that a, a surgeon would actually use to put on that piece, that prosthetic. So it's very intense. It can hold like a lot. Um, and then in terms of the other glue, like Gorilla Glue, they send a lot of glue to me now. They're, and uh, they're like, have you tried this new glue, Lyle? And I'm like, gladly. Um, but yeah, it's prosate is very, it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else practical or not? Okay, I'll go. Hi. Hi. Your work is like, Astounding. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and learn more about you and your process. Thank you. It's just um, really awe inspiring. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> it's very moving. Um, so each piece is such a unique creation and piece of art. I'm wondering once you have that on your face, I mean, how do you save it? <laughs> Or do you? Or yeah, you just... I was told by a gallerist uh, recently, she's, he said actually, he had said, Lyle, there will be a day when they will want to do a retrospective of your work and you will want to have kept every single piece. So every little chicken scratch that you do on a napkin, on an airplane, anything that you do, keep. So I've kept as much as I possibly can sometimes. Excuse me, sometimes when I'm removing the piece from my face, sometimes they're so delicate that you will lose things. But, in, but typically, 
everything is kept, they're bagged. There's a storage facility in North Van that now things are getting put in there. Um, I think I'm going to need to have someone who's very gifted in the organizational department come in and like give some semblance to order of that. Um, but for right now, I've kept that. And then in the studio, I like to have as much stuff around me as possible so that it's constantly inspiring me and triggering other things. And so those are pieces are like on a big giant magnetic board and they're magnetized all over the wall and I like to trade those out on a regular basis so that it's like your own kind of window dressing in a way so that that's a constant source of inspiration um yeah thank you thank you very much um so I know We've spoken at length when we were doing the window, um, but you started out doing these things at home and taking photos, you said, in like your shower stall. Um, has you become more well-known, done the windows of Bergdorf, worked with Gucci and Rick and Wolf, and even collaborated with us here at Inform. How has that impacted your work and how has that, has it changed any of your understanding of yourself and why you're doing this or? That's a great question. And before I answer the question, I have to say a huge thank you to Kaido, who is so helpful here at Inform. Like that's Kaido. So amazing. <laughs> thank you very much. Like hanging stuff, and no one needs to come down this millimeter. And he's he's incredible. Um, I was going to say. Um, can you refresh my memory just two seconds, kind of? What were you? What was my question? <laughs> um, how has the collaboration oh, yes. worked yes. changed how you made you your own work? So I've, I've understood, because when people are asking you questions and you're having to like really think, because sometimes I'm like, well, my hands are just doing stuff, and then you can't just always say that. People are going to want a little more than that. So I'm like, really taking, I really took time to kind of figure out in my mind, what am I doing? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? What am I attracted to, etc. And one of the main things that I keep coming back to now, which I've become completely, I'm aware that I'm completely obsessed with, is the concept of story. And what I mean by that is that all of the garbage now that gets sent from around the world or that's gifted from friends or family members, there is stories that have been embedded into each of those pieces. So those tin hearts that were shipped from Mexico City that were found on a street somewhere, I'm like, where did those hearts come from? Whose house did they belong in? Why were they purchased? Or were they handmade? Or, you know, was this a family heirloom? There's all of these different stories that are embedded into each of those pieces. Um, and there's so many stories, even in the mundane objects of everyday life, that we completely disregard, like a tube of toothpaste that's, you know, someone in a factory, maybe they didn't actually make that tube, but they pushed a button, and what was their life like? What is their life like? And going to this monotonous job of going to a toothpaste factory every day and, like, pushing buttons, like, what is, what is your life like? So I love figuring all of that out, or at least making that up in my mind, and using all of those stories and those pieces of garbage and then giving them a new additional story or a new life to those pieces. So I think how the work has changed, Kaido, is more about the understanding of what fascinates me and why I do what I do. And yeah. Questions? Hello. Um, Hi, Paul. First of all, I can organize things really well. Yes, you, you know can. that. Um, have you ever had an adverse reaction or like a politically incorrect, was someone assumed something was politically incorrect that you were doing or you had a picture or a, an object that someone didn't like, they thought it was... You know, like, yeah, I know what you're, I know yeah. what you're asking, but no, it hasn't happened, knock on wood. Um, 
Yeah, no, it hasn't. I remember actually the one image, uh, where is it? Let me see if I can find it here. Oh, this one. I remember when I first originally started painting the black onto my face and Richard was like, are you gonna get like black face comments, Lyle? And, but I mean, clearly it's beyond black face and that would never even, but at the time, I mean, I'm bringing up Gucci again, but Gucci had the mask with the red lips on it that caused so much craze that people were just like all up in arms over everything. Um, but no, typically, I haven't, I haven't had an issue and, you know, it's, I think in social media, people can say very hateful, anonymous comments. And I'm so very grateful that I don't have to deal with that. People write the most lovely, heartfelt messages that are truly supportive of the work. And it's, it's really quite, I'm shocked, but I'm very grateful. Yeah. Awesome. I think, oh, okay. Um, it was great to hear about Instagram and how you feel like that's allowed you to expose your work to everyone and like all over the world. But do you feel like if you had grown up in this age where you're bombarded by these images, it would have taken away from your creativity and like it would have limited you because you would be like, oh, someone else has done this. So it's no longer a new thing. I think that sometimes people, and nowadays, I was talking, I went back to Saskatchewan just recently and I was talking to my old art teacher. She's the only teacher that still works at the school. She's the very last one. And it was so nice to see her. And we had this amazing conversation. And she said, you know, Lyle, nowadays, the kids in the art class, as soon as they have a conversation, they just pull out their phones and they're like looking for inspiration on their phone. And I was like, you're allowed, to, they're allowed to have their phones in, this, in the art class? And she's like, sad, but it's true. I'm like, well, something's got to stop there. Like, let's put that away. She's like, but, you know, this is their day and age and this is how they relate. And I'm like, okay, valid. It's just a different way of thinking. So we need to embrace that. But I've had talks for different schools and students, et cetera. And I will tell all of them, I'm like, if you're looking for inspiration, put your phone down, get out into the world travel around, open your eyes, meet new people. All of these kind of things are going to bring inspiration to you that's beyond your phone. Because so often when people are like, well, who is, who's, a, let's say, a makeup artist that you're inspired by? I'm like, why well, don't I appreciate many makeup artists, but I'm not inspired by makeup artists. And for me to go through a bunch of makeup artists things, I think that that's actually just going to do a disservice to my own work because then I will have those thoughts kind of subconsciously in my head. And I would rather look at, you know, crossing the Broad Street Bridge and seeing yesterday, I was like, oh my gosh, this person's wheel fell off their suitcase. That's a cool shape. That's coming to the studio with me. <laughs> and so that will get, like, I mean, that's inspiration, you know, I feel. And so... That's what I would encourage people to kind of make that separation. Phones are great and they do a lot of amazing things, but there are so many other sources of inspiration out there. Just open your eyes. Thank you very much for sharing all this with us. Um, as a visual artist and as an architect, I'm completely inspired and reborn again. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you. When I looked at your book, being a visual kind of person, I was, I've always been compelled by this imagery, but the storytelling really blew me away. And Brian came to you and said, oh, who are these people? It's me. But you invented all these characters. It was just the most wonderful thing. I really got into the reading of the storytelling. And you kind of half answered that. And you see the objects that you find. Sometimes they tell your story and it starts to evolve, right? It's fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank the inspiration. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, and that's a good segue there. Uh, the books are for sale, and Lyle will sign, right? Yeah, and the books that Nancy has here are the ones you can't get on Amazon. They're limited edition. They're designed just for occasions like this. Um, 
So I'm glad that those particular books are in their hands, yeah. Uh, your work is really amazing. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, had you ever thought, just because of the, the ways that masks let you sort of inhabit different um, realities, I guess you could say, of collaborating with dance or theater or telling a story that's... Well, it's regard. very interesting that you would ask that because la... <laughs> Excuse me. Getting over... You know when you're finishing up a cold and you have that dumb, pathetic cough? Yes. That just happened. <laughs> um, so last night, I put the packing on pause. I have too many things to do, but I'm like, this is very important. So I went to a dance presentation last night. Um, this dance company reached out to me and they had said, you know, we're big fans of your work and we're actually creating a show that's largely inspired by your ideology and art and taking garbage and turning it into something else. And um, so I created the mask headpiece and like all these crazy arm extensions for the main character of the dance. And that was the the first time to see it in that genre. And if you guys haven't seen, I think the show is playing for another few days um, at the Scotiabank Dance Center. It literally took my breath away. It's the most, it was so beautiful. It was like dance, but like theater. And they have, you can see how the concept of like garbage and found objects, they're like running across the stage, like inanimate objects, literally like running across the stage that people, this like deity creatures, like pulling into her world that she builds into this. And then she has this unveiling at the end where she's just covered in garbage that's all dipped in white. Um, anyways, yes, I love dance and I would totally do more of that for sure. Can I ask you a of course. <laughs> Come on. Well, I just wanted to say that um, Lyle and I grew up together, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't be more proud, really. Um, I'm vigilant because <laughs> you remind me of all the beautiful people that I know in Saskatchewan. I often hear that, like, people from the West Coast or various other places in Canada talk about Saskatchewan people that they've met, and they think that they're so lovely and that they're the salt of the earth, and... I think that you are the best representation of that, and I'm so proud of you, and honestly, thank you for spreading that. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you, Katie. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Katie was always the prettiest girl in high school. <laughs> I always was embarrassed to talk to her because, like, she's so pretty, I can't actually talk to her. But then because my brother was the president of the high school, then I kind of was, like, had access to the pretty girl. And anyways, so. It's lovely. It's lovely. And I agree with you, though I wouldn't limit the fact that he's a nice representation or good representation of Saskatchewanians. Is that what you are? I don't know, whatever. I think of just to the human race. Yeah. yeah. Think of a little bit more broad. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Lyle. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everyone.